share what you've, you've given. Um, you ask this in your name. Amen. So, uh, <clears throat> today we continue our study of Romans 13, um, which is starting to remind me a lot about Romans 8, just by the amount of depth of teaching it contains. Last week we saw how clearly love is fulfilled all the requirements of the law, and how this lined up with what God said in both the Old Testament and in what Jesus said. All scripture agrees that love is a defining characteristic of God's people. But love does not mean that we either become people's punching bags, nor does it mean that we allow sin to become acceptable within the church. So when we see sin poking its head in a brother or sister's life, we need to first check our own lives, repent and deal with our sin, and then go deal with the sin in spiritual siblings' lives as well. It's not a time not to deal with their sin nor yours. This love for others is a love that others can see. Remember, Jesus said that the world will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Our love for God and others fulfills the laws. You would not murder someone that you loved. You would not steal from them if you loved them. You would not covet what they had if you truly loved them. And while we didn't mention it last week, the same is true if we truly love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We would not allow other small g-gods into our lives like money or jobs or TV or anything else. We would not need an image of God to bring him down to our level. We would not treat God as common, using his name as an explicative, and we would honor the day that he gave us to rest. If we truly loved God, we would do it by picking up our crosses and following him, regardless of where he leads us. By the way, our love for God is also seen in how we honor those in authority over us, as we saw two weeks ago. Remembering that we owe it to our neighbors to love them. The New Living Translation says we're under obligation to love them. Not just because we have to, but because we recognize how God loves us. We should imitate him and love others around us. This need to demonstrate is important, this love for others to see. Let's flip over to Romans 13, and we'll start in verse 11 today. Romans 13. Just going to cover 11 to 14 today. And Paul writes, and I'm reading from the NLT uh, because it's a good thought-for-thought thought passage. This is all the more urgent, for you now know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost done. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or in immoral living or in quarreling or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Paul starts off this by saying, this is all the more urgent. Remember, we just reviewed what we, he said in the verse of 13. That's what he's saying is, because of this, time is running out. There's a sense of urgency. He wanted them to know that the sand in their hourglass was running out. And he says, wake up. That salvation was closer than it was when they first believed. Let me clarify something. When Paul said that salvation was nearer, did Paul mean that they were not saved yet? No. The salvation Paul is talking about is not salvation that we receive when God imparts Jesus' righteousness on us and puts our sins on him. That we call justification. That is when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts. In Romans 10, verses 9 to 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. We are saved when heart and mind recognize our place before our Lord. And this is more than just words we say. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to the crowds, If any of you wants to be my followers, you must follow, uh, turn from your selfish ways, repent, and take up your cross daily and follow me. People who carried a cross owned nothing. They accepted that they were about to lose their lives. That was their future. Every step that they took was just one more step. Paul described this as being a living sacrifice, and it was our reasonable response to a God who gave his only son to die for us in our place. We're supposed to be living sacrifices, willing to give up everything for God. Sacrifices who live for one purpose, to serve their God out of love, not obligation. Now, Paul's not talking about justification here. We are saved in an instant. But until we die, we are not to live like the rest of the world. Salvation is not fire insurance for after we die. It is the beginning of a mighty transformation where God molds us into the image of his son. And he does so by bringing tests and trials into our life, by bringing other believers, by, by looking at his word, we're slowly but surely turned into an image of his son. Remember Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, verses uh, 3 to 5, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, Nicholas, Nic Nic exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Being born again is the start of a life journey. And so being born again is the beginning. Just as a baby is not born mature or complete, talking in full sentences, walking and Unfortunately, not diaper trained or potty trained, but they grow and mature over time. Some faster, some slower, but they all grow. In fact, if you have a baby that's 10 years old and they still are, are a baby, there's a problem there. And changes happen when they mature. Physical changes, but also emotional and intellectual changes. Remember how Paul uh, said this in reference to the way he loved others? In 1 Corinthians 13, verse, verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. All Christians start out as baby believers, newborn babies. But they can't stay there. They shouldn't stay there. They need to grow and mature into the image of our Lord feeding on the very word of God. We must put away the childish ways. Paul said it, you know, I put away. It was, a, it was a conscious effort to set aside the childish ways. And the same is true for Christians. When we are born again, we start out as baby Christians. What do we know? Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. But we don't stay there. We grow and mature. Because... In Ephesians 4.14, it says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. You see, immature believers are susceptible to errant teaching. They will accept it because it maybe makes sense to them. Maybe it makes sense to their worldly side still because they won't have the ability or maturity to question what's being said. Just as you can tell a child almost anything, and they'll believe it. Immature Christians will believe anything that makes sense. Turn on your TV, watch a televangelist. The amount of followers they have, the amount of money they have to justify their sin, from greed to envy for everyone but themselves. Yet people keep sending them money. Because the one thing these false teachers don't want is mature believers who will ask them questions about their hypocrisy and their heresies. 
So the salvation that Paul is talking about here in Romans 13 11 is our future salvation from the bondage of sin and decay. You see, in every true believer, there's a war going on. In Galatians 5.17, Paul writes, The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature or flesh desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And this is what when Paul earlier in Romans said in Romans 7.15, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And he finally concluded in verse uh, 24 and 25 of Romans 7, Oh, what a miserable, or like the ESV or King James, what a wretched man I am. Who will uh, free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he answers his own question. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. At some point, we will, those who are believers, will be delivered by Jesus from the sinful flesh and nature and be given bodies untainted, untempted by sin. Is that an amazing thought? Because at some point, Jesus is going to return and he's going to take us home. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away all the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting for him. This again is the salvation that Paul is talking about in Romans 13 being delivered from these bodies of sin. And the only ones who will eagerly await for him will be those that are his. Remember, Jesus told his disciples on the same night when he gave us the Lord's table. Now let's flip over. I can feel fingers twitching. So turn over to John 14. John 14, verses 1 to 3. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And... If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus wanted to comfort his disciples. Remember, they could tell something was up because this was not just an ordinary night. And remember, by the end, Jesus said, I want to tell you so much more, but your brains can't handle it. So... But Jesus was saying that he was going to prepare a place and that everything would be ready, he would return to collect his own. Because why? He wants to be with us always. Isn't that amazing? The Son of God wants to spend eternity with you and I. I thought I got an amen on that. Uh, doesn't that make you everything else in your life today pale in comparison? To spend your rest of eternity with Jesus? Now Jesus will not announce when it, this will happen. We, like Paul and anyone else, don't know when Jesus is returning. Every time I hear a Christian leader say, hey, I figured it out. I know when he's going to come. We, Tracy's family has a little cabin in the middle of Pennsylvania woods, and close by there's a little settlement or the foundations of a settlement. Some guy in the 1800s said, I know Jesus is going to come. Let's build a, sell everything we own and build a house or cabins up on the hill so we can meet him first. Never came. Oh, I got it wrong. I did, redid some calculations. You can still see the, the foundations of their folly. No one knows the time or the hour. 
They just show their ignorance. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, However, no one knows the day or the hour that these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And his return is something that every one of us should be looking forward to. If you're in John, flip over two books to Mark 13. Mark 13. Mark 13, starting in verse 34. Our rule here is, if it's three verses or more, we flip to it. If it's two verses or less, I'll just read it. So Mark 13, verse 34. It says, The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch it for his return. You too must keep watch, for you don't know when the master of the household will return, in the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. Are you watching for Jesus today? This is a theme that Jesus repeats very often to his followers about his return. Being on the watch for when he returns. But notice in what else Jesus said to each of his slaves. And yes, we are all God's slaves. The word should not offend you. When you see in the modern translations, servant, it means bond slaves. And so it says, well, you know, that's a voluntary slave, so it doesn't really matter. If you're a bond slave and you disobey your master, guess what? You get punished just like a regular slave does. So in Romans 6.22, But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Again, this is part of our fundamentally change at salvation. We've been freed from the slavery of sin, but now we're slaves to God. We are to be doing something besides just sitting around and waiting for Jesus to return, right? In the middle of verse 34, the master says, when he left, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were supposed to do while they're go he's gone. Every believer here has an instruction. You have something you should be doing besides watching and waiting. In fact, we call it the Great Commission. Matthew 28 Ah, keep one more book off to the left. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the work we've been assigned to do as believers. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 46, if the master returns and finds his servants have done a good job, there will be a reward. We should be ready with what we're doing to show Lord, the Lord. Not that it gives us eternal life. That's a gift. But a Christian can't help but do good works that bring glory to God. Even if it costs us our life. James 1.12 said, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You see, while we have been here on earth, we have to live like Paul. Remember what Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians, or Phil, church in Philippi? Uh, Philipp, Philippians 1, 21 to 24, he says, For me, to me, living means living to Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go to be with Christ, which would be far better for me, 
but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. We live the life of a slave of Christ, walking the path God has laid before us, living lives that bring honor to glory and glory to God, working in whatever field God has placed us in. And like Paul, we are to be a blessing to those around us, proclaiming the gospel with our words and being literally a living gospel by the way we live our lives, knowing that we may be the only Jesus that people meet on their way of life. And we should be watering what other believers around us have planted, planting new seeds of the gospel in other people's lives, and, and reaping by those who accept the message of the gospel, all the while anticipating the Savior's return to take us home. And this is what we're doing while we wait for Jesus. We proclaim the good news, we make disciples, and we baptize and teach. And remember, the object of teaching is to grow more maturity into them. And we do this while we're watching for his return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42 to 44, So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day the, your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when the burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least, uh, least expected. And Jesus points out this very well-known fact. A thief does not call you up and say, Hey, I'd like to make an appointment. I'd like to come visit your house. Hopefully you're not home or maybe you're asleep. You know, no, he always looks. Uh, this church has been broken into twice. They never called me up. I, I don't know if I didn't get the message. But they do so to catch people unawares. And likewise, when the Son of Man returns, we're not going to be, it's going to be a time when we least expect it. Again, Jesus is anticipating his return as well. He's waiting for the Father to give his okay. Remember, he died for us with the anticipation that he's going to spend eternity with us. And if, think about it. If the time was so urgent back in Paul's day when he wrote this letter, how much more urgent is it now? Everyone here is one week closer to being fully sanctified than we were last week. As long as we're truly born again, something only God and each individual can truly know about themselves. After all, the Bible says only God sees our hearts. And you and I know, because when you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in our hearts, you can't miss that. He wants us to be ready, be watchful, be alert, and be diligent. But as Paul, Jesus and later Paul recognized that people might get fatigued waiting. Tom Petty sang in the 80s, the waiting is the hardest part. You see, when you keep waiting for something to happen and it doesn't occur, it's easy to start to lapse into a mindset that it won't happen, at least not in the immediate time frame like right now, or in a less immediate time frame like maybe a minute from now, until you slip into waiting in words only, but living a life that like you Believe that it'll never happen until it gets to the point where you don't even think about it. And you allow other things to start to crowd out your days and your thoughts. And our men's Bible study, I, I, I shared with them that illustration I used about I could hide behind uh, two quarters. Um, and the way you do that is you put the quarters up to the person's eyes. They can't see around them. Christians should be living with their eyes focused on God not on the things that are happening around them. Jesus warned in Luke 21, 34, and 36, Watch out! Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let the day catch you unaware, like a trap, for that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors, and stand before the Son of Man. It can be easy over time for errant doctrine to sleep into our thought processes. We worry about things that we should not be worrying about. We attempt to solve problems that are not ours to solve. 
we put our faith in men and women in, in government and high officials. We shouldn't. We should be praying. Prayer is a source of, to God's strength. Jesus says many will have their hearts dulled by carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of life. When we pray to God and we share with him our concerns, our Heavenly Father can change things. We can call on him and he can deliver us. Jumping back to Romans 13, Paul emphatically says, wake up. Jesus warned us not to sleep, be watchful, and actively doing what we've been assigned to do. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, physical sleep. Jesus and Paul are talking about spiritual sleep. A couple months ago, Tracy and I were driving, and we were talking, and suddenly I took a micro nap. I was exhausted. Literally fell asleep at the wheel for maybe two seconds. I hit a curb. And it just happened. I didn't even know. Thank God that's all I hit. Well, Christians sometimes take spiritual micro naps. It's just you, you, you let errant doctrine in, into your life. You let your guard down for a second, and you give Satan a foothold to your lives or in the life of the church. In Romans 13, 12, Paul says, The night, though, is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put them on the shining armor of right living. As we've seen, we are living in dark times. But the day of salvation, the day that Jesus has returned, is a week closer than we were. And we need to be ready. The dark time is rapidly disappearing and Jesus is coming again. I cannot say that enough. Jesus is coming again. And so Paul says, remove your dark clothes. When Christians sought to sleep in their faith, they sought to look and act like the world. They focus on the good things they do. They forget what God's word says about their righteous deeds. Remember in, in uh, Isaiah 64, 6, I, I like the way the NLT says it. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're nothing but filthy rags. And like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sin sweeps us away like the wind. That's the way the world is. They look and they say, hey, do good works. It'll make God happy. No. The best things we can do without uh, the Holy Spirit inside of us a filthy rags before a holy God. We need to get back to our core belief and start living again like children of God. Remember what Jesus said to a church in Ephesus, one of the seven churches I spoke to in the book of Revelation. Let's go to it. How can we talk about the end times without jumping to Revelation? Revelation 2. Revelation 2, and we'll just look at the seven verses there. <clears throat> he writes, says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven saws in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Wow, I, I, that's, that's a lot for them to do, right? But look at what verse four, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Remember, the church in Ephesus 
sought out really, really well. They had pastors like Paul and t later Timothy. And yet they were doing all the right things. But not with the same heart attitude. They weren't doing it for the love of God or for the love of each other. Jesus said that their love had grown cold. So while they were doing the right things, saying the right words, Jesus said, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Because of all those correct things you were doing done without love, it's like clanging cymbals or banging gongs. Without love, we're nothing. And so we cast off our dark deeds, our, our earthly deeds, and put on the armor of light to protect our walk. Flip over to Ephesians 6. And just as we can't get away from Revelations, we also need to look at Ephesians to talk about armor. Ephesians 6. Our strength is not in our number of people or in our money, but in the Lord and his mighty power. If you're trusting in, in the number of people or the amount of money you have, you're worshiping the wrong God. Paul writes, starting uh, Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every armor of God every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these things, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on the salvation as your helmet and take on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on all occasions. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The last piece of armor is our prayers in the Spirit. Again, we stay alert and be persistent in our prayers, and we call on the name of the Lord for our strength. All believers we pray for, everywhere, who are believers, are part of the same church. One of the Christian's defenses given to us by God is this armor that he's given us, the armor of light. He writes, in, jumping back to Romans 13, 13, he says, Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties or drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or immoral living or quarreling and jealousy. We should be decent people, living lives that don't revolve around the world's priorities and values. In fact, in verse 14, he continues, he says in Romans 13, 14, instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about the ways to indulge your evil desires. Notice Paul doesn't says, don't let yourself think of ways to indulge desires. Remember, sin is a choice. You can choose to sin and you can choose not to sin. It starts in our hearts. You may say, but I'm basically a good person. I've never stolen, never murdered, never had an affair. But that's only on the outside. What about your inside? Have you ever coveted? Have you ever gotten angry? Jesus said, if you've gotten angry, you've committed murder in your heart. If you've driven in New York State, chances are, and especially down the city, I'm sure you get angry at times, right? Yeah. So, have you ever lusted after anyone, even a second look? Well, you've just committed adultery. No. 
These are things that we should not practice as believers. We should not even think on these things. Instead, redirect your thoughts. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me. Everything you have heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. We think on the godly things. And look at it. It's not just thinking. You know, Paul said, look at the things I think about these things that you've heard from me, but also the things that you saw him doing. You can't just be a Christian in thought only. You have to put into practice those things that you've learned. Jesus said that, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you hear my words that I do say and you do them, you're building a house on a firm foundation. He says, but if you just hear my words only, that's the people who build their houses on sand. Uh, and then when the storms of life come, your house just, your spiritual house just collapses. Before he died, Tracy's dad noted a difference in Christians. He said when his mother and his grandmother were alive, so that would be Tracy's great-grandmother, or his, her grandmother and great-grandmother, he says they couldn't stop talking about Jesus' return. That could, something that they constantly talked about, that it could be today, and they were excited about it. And today things are different. Today you talk to Christians and they're more concerned about the state of the world and they're worried about what's happening in Israel or worried about the Ukraine. They're worried about this or they're worried about that. We, we, we see kids being taught and indoctrinated in schools to the latest things that the church is going through. Everything that they, they do, that they're, they're getting upset about. But these things of the world mean less than nothing when put in light of the eternity. You see, the problem today is like many churches in Paul's days, Christians got tired of waiting. They've been lulled to sleep. They're sleeping on the job. Slowly but surely, the enemy has entered churches and they're teaching, whispering lullaby themes of peace and safety, making Christianity a shell of itself. Instead of being a group of people willing to die for what they believe, they become spiritual cowards, often afraid of offending people with the sharing the gospel. Instead, they just tell others what they should do to avoid hell. Again, salvation is not just fire insurance. We share the gospel because we're obeying the God that we love. We share out of obedience, but we also share out of love for our neighbors. Today, it's the Christians do need to wake up Paul, like many great Christians, lived in anticipation. They didn't dread Jesus' return or wish that God would wait for one reason or another. No, when Paul looked at the time of Christ's coming, it was with great anticipation. Jesus gave us a parable about how we should be waiting. Uh, flip over to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by a shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared the lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough oil for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some up for yourselves. But while they were gone to meet by oil, the bridegroom came. And then those who were ready 
went in with him into a marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Notice, all five, all ten uh, virgins in the parable, or bridesmaids, went to sleep. But five were prepared for the groom to come, and five were not. What that preparation cost the wise uh, ones? It cost them money. It cost them effort. They had to carry those things. It's probably very inconvenient to lug around that extra oil. But in the end, it was worth it. They understood that when the bridegroom came, he could come at any time. And they didn't want to gamble for when it was convenient for them. So today, you may have been taught that it's easy to be a Christian. Just say a prayer, get some baptized, get your head wet, do some devotions, maybe hang out with some Christians. But when Jesus compared his followers to slaves working their field, that's what he meant. They didn't have air-conditioned tractors or refrigerated water coolers. They didn't even have set work hours. They worked until they were told to stop. And even... When they weren't working their fields, they were still slaves to their master. Somehow many Christians have come to believe that they're better than others. Somehow God is obligated to say them because they just said a prayer. This is a result of errant teaching. Like Paul, we need to be willing to be poured out like a drink offering to the very last drop with our lives. I've heard Christians say in the past, can't wait for Christ to come again, but I'd prefer if he uh, waited a little longer. But remember, God's the one who calls people. It's God's responsibility to bring them. You can't argue someone into heaven. And Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Such a thought. Jesus has not come back today because he knows those who will come to salvation beforehand. And they're not ready yet. They haven't come yet. And as I was writing that down, a terrible thought came to me. There's a time coming when this world will be full of people and no one will be coming to Jesus no one else will cry out for his mercy and for his grace. Remember Jesus said after he talked about the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, 8, but when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Jesus told the Jews of his day in Matthew 16, 2 and 3, he says, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather today. You know, we've made it part of our own, right? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. He says, you knew how, know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of these times. Today, we don't know when he's coming back but we should be able to recognize the times and the signs of the times as the day approaches. And we're going to go and run through a couple of these uh, passages and then I'll, I'll dismiss us. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 11. <laughs> First Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, Now concerning how and when this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know well that the day of the Lord's return will come in unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying, everything is at peace and secure, then disaster will fall on him as suddenly as a pregnant woman labors planes begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. 
for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and the night, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through his, our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up as you are already doing. We have to stay alert. Jesus said in Luke 21, verses 25 to 28, And there will be strange signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And here on earth the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and the strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud with power and great glory, so that when all these things begin to have happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. And also in Matthew 24, sorry, in verse 6, he says, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many places in the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see, too many Christians today trust God enough to take them to heaven, but not enough to trust him with their day-to-day -day living. They live lives dependent on what the physical eyes are telling them. So their lives begin more and more to look like the world. We see this in many churches and Christians, as Paul warned in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from such people. Nothing is sacred. Years ago, if someone addressed God with anything but the sense of awe, they would be looked at as a non-believer regardless of what they said. But today our society has made the image of God common. There's going to be a rise of mockers and doubters. In 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last day, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the day the world was first created. Peter warns of scoffers, doubters, that everything's going to be is the same. And Jude elaborated on these scoffers. In Jude 1.18, he says, They told you that in the last time there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly uh, desires. The people who so doubt and scoff at God just want power of their own. And this attitude will affect churches. When Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, for the time is coming when people will no longer listen to a sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and trace after the myths. People today will look at church as a place of fellowship, 
but they will no longer listen to sound teaching. Oh, they may sit and listen and someone go on and on for like a two-hour sermon. Um, but when asked to participate, to dig deeper in the Bible, to be part of a Bible study, ah, no, I, I, I know enough. Can you ever know enough of an eternal God? Remember, Jesus said, no one but the Father knows when his return is. You know, it occurred to me, that means Satan doesn't know either. Which is probably explains why when John wrote in 1 John 2, 18 and 19, he said, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged to, with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. Then they left, to, and it proved that they did not belong to us. Satan is waiting along with everyone else for Jesus to return. And he keeps sending antichrists, false teachers. Today, many Christians and churches, love has grown cold, as the indictment of Ephesus was. Church has become a list of do's and don'ts. Christianity is, you do this, don't do that. We call them checklist Christians. Oh, I did this today, I did that. Up, oh, I got to work on that. We don't do things because we have to. We do things because we love our neighbor as ourselves, and we understand that God, God loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us. It's been said that what the one reason that people die when they get lost in the woods is they die of embarrassment. They're too proud to admit that they can't, that they could possibly get themselves lost. So they waste valuable time wandering about. They blow through valuable resources just wandering about. I can't be lost. I know too much. And before they fail to accept the fact that they're lost and deal with that, they run out of strength. They run out of resources. They run out of food and water. And likewise, there are many Christians who have been misguided by errant teaching. They believe the lie that they know enough to be saved and have no interest in learning anything more or putting themselves out there for others to see and so fall to the sin of pride. And they too will die of pride. Wake up. Realize you are acting like the world. Take off your worldly garments even if you look good in them. Today, the world's values and ideas have crippled many a church and have rendered the gospel message impotent. When, people, when you tell people you believe in an almighty, all-powerful God that you can talk to, but then you complain that you're too old, you're too small, you're too poor, oh, boo-hoo-hoo, we can't do this because of these reasons, you're telling people you really don't believe in God. You're, you're concerned about everything. Pray, yes, but do. Today is then. Get rid of those filthy thoughts and ideas. Put on God's armor of light. And as Ephesians says, stand firm in the Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you for, for when your son returns. Lord, we can't wait to meet him in the air. Lord, we ask that we live our lives like Luther said, that Jesus died yesterday, rose again today, and is coming back tomorrow. What a change in our lives that would be, that we would live in such a manner. Lord, we can't wait for you to return. Let our eyes be focused on that above all else and live our lives like little Christs before the world. In your name, amen.